Consider the following subspaces of R2. The first one is the open disk D, that is the collection of points that have radius at most one. The second one is the annulus A. This is made out of the points whose radius squared is in between one half and three halves. As subsets of the plane, A and D both inherit the Euclidean topology from R2. Our goal as topologists is to classify topological spaces. In this particular case, even though A and D look very different, one could imagine that there's some sophisticated homeomorphism that identifies the two. In this video, we will explore this question and figure out whether this is the case. However, here's a little spoiler alert for those of you that are impatient. It turns out that A and D are truly different topological spaces, and we will describe briefly the tools needed to prove this. On previous courses on topology, you've probably encountered already some techniques to study this problem. What we normally do is we pick a property that is invariant under homeomorphisms, and we check whether each of the two spaces satisfies it or not. For instance, we can ask ourselves whether the disk or the annulus are Hausdorff, which means that given two points in our topological space, we can find corresponding neighborhoods that are disjoint. The key fact to recall is that as subsets of R2, they inherit a notion of distance, and being metric spaces, they are necessarily Hausdorff. Let's check then some other property. For instance, are they both compact? On the left, we see a sequence of points in the disk that approaches the circle. This implies that there's no convergent subsequence and therefore the disk is not compact. We can also find a escaping sequence on the annulus. Therefore, we conclude that both spaces are not compact. A statement that you're probably familiar with is the heine borel theorem. It says that the compact subsets of Euclidean space are those that are bounded and closed. Therefore, invoking this theorem and noting that both the annulus and the disk we're considering are open, we could have deduced as well that they must be non-compact. Let's move on to connectedness. In this setting, it is easier to check path connectedness, which implies connectedness. Given two points P and Q in D, we can readily observe that the straight segment between them is contained in the disk as well. The situation in the annulus is a bit different because the straight segment connecting P with Q may pass through the hole that is missing from the annulus. However, it's still possible to connect any two points simply by tracing an arc that avoids the hole. We have tested the disk and the annulus using Hausdorffness, compactness, and connectedness. However, these properties haven't been able to tell us that these two spaces are not homeomorphic because they gave us the same answer in both cases. However, it is quite intuitive that the two cannot possibly be homeomorphic. Namely, the annulus has this really distinctive hole in the middle. The question is whether we can find a tool that allows us to detect the presence of this hole. Let us inspect the annulus a bit closer and let's see what we can come up with. Something that we noticed already is that paths in the annulus and in the disk behave quite differently. Namely, paths in A have to avoid the hole. We already encountered before the path gamma. It goes from P to Q using the upper part of the annulus. Instead of gamma, we could have chosen another path, let's call it nu, that goes from P to Q using the lower part of A. Or furthermore, we could have chosen a path that makes a whole loop around the hole before reaching Q. It is a good idea to pause the video at this point and try to come up with further examples of paths that turn different amounts around the hole before reaching Q. The intuition is that we can detect the hole from the fact that all these paths are tied to it in different ways. For instance, since gamma and nu are tied differently to the hole, we shouldn't be able to deform one into the other. What we should do at this point is to make precise what we mean by deforming a path into another path. The intuitive idea is exactly what you expect. You can picture a movie of curves that starts with a given curve gamma and finishes at some other given curve gamma tilde. During this process, we require not only that every single curve is continuous, but also that the family as a whole is continuous in time. Such a continuous family of curves is called a homotopy, and it follows that a homotopy can never suddenly jump from one place in the annulus to another. In particular, if we try to deform gamma into nu, we will fail, because the hole serves as an obstacle that we cannot cross. 
This means that we found the tool that we wanted. Once we prove that there are paths that cannot be deformed into one another, we've essentially proven that there's a hole somewhere that is stopping us from doing so. Let's compare this to what happens in the disk. Given any two points P and Q and some arbitrary path connecting them depicted in blue, what we can do is apply a linear interpolation to take the path to the straight segment. Therefore, since any path can be deformed to the straight segment, any two paths can be deformed to each other. We conclude that there's a single equivalence class of paths up to deformation. You should think of this as saying that since there's no hole in D, we cannot tie paths to it in different ways. Up to checking formally everything that we've claimed so far, we are actually done. We've proven that D and A are not homeomorphic to one another, and we did this by formalizing the idea that A has a hole in the middle. Let us use our insight about paths to study other topological spaces. Another good example is the circle S1, and it seems pretty clear that it has a hole in the middle that we can try to detect. For simplicity, let us focus on paths that begin and end at 1, and we will call this quite descriptively loops. The simplest loop is the constant loop, that is, for every t we simply send t to the value 1. You should think of the constant loop as a loop that is not tied to the hole. Next, we can consider the loop that turns once counterclockwise around the circle and at constant speed. Similarly, we can consider the loop that turns at constant speed also counterclockwise but twice, or the loop that turns twice clockwise. In general, given any integer, we can find a loop that turns k times around the circle at constant speed. One of the first theorems that we will prove in the course is that the equivalence classes of loops in S1 are in correspondence with the integers, and the correspondence is precisely given by counting how much they are wrapped around the hole. You may have noticed that there is a very strong similarity between what we explained regarding the annulus and what we explained regarding S1. In fact, we will be able to formalize the idea that both of them have the same holes in a suitable sense. The definition that is of interest to us is the following. It says that two topological spaces, B and C, are homotopy equivalent if they have the same shape up to the formation. What this means is that we are able to find a map from B to C and a map from C to B such that they may not be inverses of one another, they may, they may not be homeomorphisms, but at least they are inverses up to the formation. This is precisely what we see with the annulus and the circle. Given S1, we can simply consider its inclusion into the annulus, and conversely, given the annulus, we can readily project it to S1. You should pause the video and convince yourself that the maps I and P define a homotopy equivalence between S1 and A. This follows from the following animation that shows how A deforms into the circle. During the course, we will not only be interested in whether topological spaces are homeomorphic, but whether they are homotopy equivalent to one another. Since the annulus and the circle are the same from this perspective, let us try to find an example that is truly different from what we've already seen. Here we see the sphere S2, and we have marked its north pole in red. Mimicking what we did for S1, we will now study loops that begin and end at the North Pole. Given such a loop, we want to find the deformation that takes it to the constant loop based on the North Pole. The first step in doing this is to make a little displacement that makes it disjoint from the South Pole. In this example, this looked very easy, but you should be careful. You've probably seen before examples of extremely badly behaved paths for instance, the piano curve is a map from the unit interval that completely covers the unit square. You can probably imagine as well a path in the sphere that covers it completely in a very wild manner, which shows that in general it may be not so easy to displace a given path from the South Pole. In any case, this is indeed possible, and once we've done that, we can identify the rest of the sphere, the complement of the South Pole, with the plane. Using the stereographic projection, we can regard our loop in the sphere as a loop in the plane. Since the plane is convex, much like the disk was before, what we can do is simply use linear interpolation to take our loop in the plane to the constant loop. 
in terms of the sphere, this will produce a deformation of our original loop into the constant loop based at the North Pole. Let us recap the situation. It seems pretty clear that the sphere has a hole in the middle. However, we've analyzed loops and we've seen that there's a single equivalence class. This implies that the loops are not getting stuck due to the presence of the hole, they are not tied to it. What we gather from this is that there's different types of holes. Some of them we can detect using loops, but some others we have to detect through other means. Let us go quickly over some examples of this. The hole in S1 or in the annulus can be detected by wrapping up a loop around it. Something very similar happens in the torus. We see that the meridian is wrapped around one of its holes and the parallel is wrapped around another one. What we should observe about this sphere is that it is the sphere itself and not a loop that is wrapped around the hole. If we want to detect this higher dimensional hole, we'll have to look at maps from the sphere to itself. All right, we've reached the end of the video, so let's summarize what we have found out. The main idea that you should take away is that one of the interesting properties that we can try to detect uh, regarding a topological space is whether it has holes or not. Some holes we will be able to detect from the fact that we can wrap a loop around them. However, not all holes are of this type. In general, in order to study a topological space B, something that is incredibly fruitful is to consider maps from some other topological space A into B in order to wrap them around the holes of B. In this way, by considering different topological spaces A, we will be able to detect different types of holes in B. In this course, we will focus on loops and on the holes we can detect with them. Another idea that we encountered is that two spaces may not be homeomorphic, but still be homotopy equivalent. And you should roughly think that that means that they have the same or equivalent holes. In general, the central theme in Topology and Meitkunde is that we will not be interested anymore in maps, but in maps up to the formation. That is everything for this video, so thanks a lot for listening, take care, and all the best.